Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And welcome to Likeable Science. I'm your host here, Ethan Allen, on Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks for joining us. Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. It's not something just that scientists do, it's something that we all do, we all practice every day. We make decisions, we make choices, we figure things out using our science, but a lot of people don't appreciate that. And so on this show we talk about why and how science is uh, likable, to be appreciated. And with me today is Rob Kinslow. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. Rob is a sustainability consultant, uh, but has a very interesting career track, basically. Rob has done a lot of things as a farmer, was a high-tech engineer for Northrop, I think, yeah. doing weapons research or something, yeah. and, and now uh, has a company, Ola Hawaii, uh, Life for Sustainable Hawaii, I think is what you said it means. Uh, so very interesting uh, track through sciences, and something that not a lot of scientists do is, is moves sort of in and out of science in, in that way, or shift so radically. I've, I've made a few shifts myself in my scientific career, but uh, nothing quite this dramatic. So, uh, Rob, why don't you tell us just a little, a little bit about sort of how you started, I mean, you started as a, in rural uh, Maryland, right? Yeah. And, and started as a farmer? Yeah, I, um, I was born and raised on an organic farm in uh, Western Maryland, and my dad uh, was uh, a farmer and a kind of technologist because he also worked uh, at Mack Trucks building these, you know, high tech trucks at the time, and then I grew up on a farm, and I spent 95% of my time out in nature. And uh, then, um, you know, when I got 18, 19, 20, I went off to, uh, and self-funded my way through the University of Maryland, became an aerospace engineer, mostly because I had a choice between archaeology and uh, aerospace engineering, and because, I- Because they both begin with A? They begin with A, I don't know. <laughs> never I, got know, any further. <laughs> one was in the earth and one was outside the earth, and so I guess that dichotomy or that, um, um, you know, right brain, left brain side of me uh, continues to this day, and once I became an aerospace engineer, I worked for Northrop Grumman for 12, 13 years. And for, for them, you did some very, it sounded like very cutting edge, weird, weird things, right? Well, uh, f f yes. Um, for that matter, the technology that I worked on 20 years ago is just now coming to operational. Right. Um, you know, the JSF, the Joint Strike Fighter, which is now the F-35, and the recent designs in uh, unmanned uh, combat air vehicles mm -hmm. uh, are just now coming out of the closet. And so I was deep in the black hole, the belly oh. of the beast, doing oh. design and, and analysis work. Truly military industrial complex. Truly, thing. very much okay. so. Wow, yeah. so that, there we go. I mean, that's, that's hard to get out of, I would think. Well, uh, I can tell you a story about yeah. that if you'd well, please like. Please do, please um, do. I can tell you how I get out, because I remember the very moment that I made the decision oh. to get yeah. out. I was in the building I worked in on this very highly stealth uh, so-called special access project uh, uh, technology. I would go through a, a locked gate, I would walk to, I would park my car, I would go to a building, I'd walk through another uh, guarded gate, I'd go in the building, I'd go through another locked door with a guard, and then I'd go to my own little cubicle which had, which had its own wall around it, and I'd unlock that, I'd go in there, unlock my documents, uh, pull out my computer, sit down on my computer, and start my day. But I was walking down the hall in between these multiple um, uh, facilities, and I saw uh, an older man coming at me. And uh, he was shuffling, and he was gray, and he was bent over, and he looked like he had been there a long time. Turns out he was the original YB-49 flying wing engineer. He had been with Northrop for 50 years wow. at that time. And I was walking down the hallway, and I looked at him, and something came over me, and I went, that's me if I don't get out of here. And uh, so I made a promise at that time to myself to, uh, to uh, break out of there. And uh, it took me three, four years, but I did. And uh, that's where, that's how I'm here today, is because I got out of there. Right, but so, okay, great. So, so you decide you're not gonna work for Northrop anymore, you don't wanna be in that end of things. But it would have seemed like maybe you go off and, and join a high-tech auto firm or a, you know something like that, where you could put, keep sort of that same, set of skills moving along, but you obviously made some different choices. I did, and um, I guess it was because of my farming background mm -hmm. and my uh, right brain uh, mm -hmm. kind of coming into its, uh, maybe its own focus or power, but uh, 
Uh, and I've often thought, why didn't I do that back then? And I, I don't really know the answer to that other than to say that I got uh, swept along by uh, traveling around the world and becoming a documentary filmmaker on um, travel show and uh, coming to Hawaii and learning about the culture and the people and the, um, the art of Lomi Lomi and practicing that and then uh, getting into community development, which is really why I quit Northrop was because I didn't want to kill people anymore, no matter what kind of people mm -hmm. they were. I wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. And so that's why he has really uh, given me that um, fertility to mm -hmm. create these uh, seeds of sustainability, as I call them. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, so what is it that, that Ola does? That's, well, that's... Uh, I have to give uh, lots of credit to Jane Yamashiro for uh, giving me uh, this project. Uh, she had a project called Ola Hawaii, and uh, um, the tagline for the project is living a sustainable Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of unpacking there to do. First sure. of all, living. Right. It implies consciousness. It implies um, practice. It implies some set of principles, practices, prin uh, and behaviors that then bring us into a place called Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that really attracted me. And after she retired, um, I continued this work um, in, in my own project-based uh, life. Okay. So did I answer so, your question? Yeah, yeah. So, no, it sounds interesting. I, I, I was just, as you were telling me that, I was just thinking, I wonder what his old colleagues from Northrop Grumman would think if he could hear him talking like this. Well, they're all, uh, you know, they're all have houses and kids and, uh, and BMWs and uh, t maybe Teslas these days. Uh, and I still stay in touch with them, mm -hmm. oh, um, right. many of them. I, you know, they're a good group of guys. Mm -hmm. and, and there were very few girls uh, in right. that group. Sure. I think one woman, one mm -hmm. woman engineer. Um, but uh, I think they respect me. I, I haven't ever asked them that, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, it's a different life for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, you've gone on, you've done a number of different projects mm -hmm. uh, over the, over the uh, years here. Maybe you could, could enlighten us with a couple of your early ones and sort of how, they, how they've then brought you. So I think you started some back on, in the States, actually. Uh, yeah, I, um, I, began, uh, my, I began my first sustainability project when I was working in Northrop. I was wa walking through this open space between Marina del Rey and Los Angeles Airport called the Bayona Wetlands. And because I, I was looking for a place to kind of get away from the concrete jungle. And I laid down on the ground, which wasn't very wet in this area, and I had an epiphany. Uh -huh. And it seemed to me at that time that all the animals and plants and all the voices of the wetlands kind of rose and came through me. And it was very kind of unsettling at the time, being in a science-based engineer, you know, very re rational, realistic based. But it, it caused me to create a land trust. And I created a land trust called the Bayona Wetlands Land Trust with a team of people. And we went on to work with others in a campaign to save 640 acres in which Steven Spielberg wanted to build his DreamWorks studio. Uh -huh. And it took us six years. And we eventually wrote a conservation easement. And we wrote a $20 million bond uh, issue that the governor of the state of California signed to purchase the land. So that was my oh. first big win. Right. And uh, right. it was That's done right. because I had an engineering job. I was able to fund that project with my engineering money. Oh. And I've always self-funded my, all my projects. So that was my first project. Oh, uh, when I came to Hawaii, I worked for a while for the Hawaii Ultimate League Association, producing a bunch of sports events videos uh, uh, you know, as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And then I began a group called Facing the Future. And we were a group of people who um, brought experts in sustainability to Hawaii, like Dr. Steven Schneider, climate change, mm -hmm. um, Richard Heinberg, uh, Francis Moore LePay, people like that, thought leaders who could educate and lift up uh, the d d discussion in Hawaii about okay. sustainability. And this was 2004 through 2008. Okay. So, whew. and then in 2008, I guess, uh, you know, uh, you know, it was, there was a big, you know, the 2007 through 2009 of the crash, you know, financial crash right. really affected a lot of people in right. Hawaii. But uh, in, in 2007, I was watching Oprah interview Al Gore mm -hmm. on her show. And I uh, saw him provide an invitation to have people come and 
um, uh, train with him in public speaking and climate change communications, mm -hmm. and I put in my application and I got accepted. Oh, I, out of 16,000 cool. people, wow. me, little me in Hawaii got accepted. And I went and was trained, and that began another whole trajectory of mm -hmm. public speaking and community education based on science, wow. the science of climate change. And I've done about almost 80 presentations around the world, as far away as Africa, California, and in Hawaii, but mostly to government and businesses, because mm -hmm. I believe that we should be talking to people who aren't in our agreement circle, who don't agree with us. We mm -hmm. should be talking to them first rather than to the people who do agree with us. True. I think that's the fatal flaw. Right, you don't need to sing to the choir. Huh? Why sing to the choir? Right, right, yeah. You know, it's mo most effective. And so that's what my campaign has been oh, here in Hawaii is mostly cool. that. Well, that, that sounds very exciting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little side trip here and, and tell one of our little campfire stories. Oh, it it, it sort, of, sort, of, sort of fits. So there's a, a little beast called the woolly bear uh, moth. Uh -huh. And the woolly bear caterpillar, basically a little fuzzy caterpillar up in the Arctic, quite ubiquitous there. And so it's born from an egg one fine spring day in the Arctic. And of course, Arctic spring and summer is very short, right? Mm -hmm. And so it frantically goes and eats and eats and eats and eats as fast as it can. But by the end of the summer, it has not gotten nearly enough food into it to go undergo metamorphosis. Huh. So it basically crawls under a rock, spins a little silken uh, robe, as it were, July's there, freezes over the winter, buried under snow. Next spring comes, snow melts away, warms up a little bit, sing thaws out, wakes back up, <laughs> transitions, uh, eats and eats and eats and eats and eats again all summer long, but typically at the end of the second summer, it still hasn't gotten enough food. Wow. Goes and wraps itself up in its little silken robe under a rock, freezes again. Now, maybe if it's in a fairly warm place down in southern Canada, it might by the third summer have enough energy and, and growth to, to turn into bit, but Far north, these things will go for 12, 14, 15 years. Wow. 15 transitions, 15 wow. cycles before they actually finally get to pupate, go and hang out as a chrysalis for a bit, and emerge as a moth, live for a few weeks, and die. You know, hopefully, hopefully having made it and laid eggs by the, by the time. But, but again, just that kind of transition that just, you know, you, you, you talk about that and it, it just put that to mind. Well, that's very interesting because I was struck by just the length of this dormancy, so-called dormancy, right. preparing for this one yes. moth <laughs> event exactly. that exactly. happens in the course of a, exactly. a summer. Exactly. That's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. I just, I, when you were telling me your story, it just hit, it a, there's a, a real peril. You've That's gone, a really a late bloomer. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about late bloomers. Persistence, right? Gets you yeah. there, you know? Yeah. Keep, keep moving away, moving ahead, moving ahead. That's what you gotta do, right? Thank you for that encouragement. Yeah, yeah. okay. I think we're about ready to, to jump out to a, a quick break. And um, so Rob Tinslow is here, a sustainability consultant, and <coughs> with me, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii, and we will be back in one minute. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you there. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. With me today in the Think Tech Studios is Rob Kinslow. Welcome again, Rob. We're talking about uh, Rob's very interesting transitions from being a farmer to being a Northrop engineer working on surfaces for high performance jet engines uh, to shifting over and sort of the epiphanies he's had that, that helped move him to really helping people develop self-sustainability mindsets and providing the tools for self-sustainability, right? Yeah. And, and you do this, I, I gather through, you've done it in different ways at different times. Mm -hmm. And currently, what, sort of what's your, what's your big focus right now in terms of, of is it still climate change stuff or you're going out and, and 
promoting that? Or are you talking more locally now? Or? Yeah, so I stopped talking about the problem so much mm -hmm. and talked much more about solutions okay. um, as I broadened my focus beyond just the specific uh, problematic of climate change. Because mm -hmm. really, cli the, the problem with climate change is really a problem inside of us and with our, uh, the way we see the world and who we are. And so m much of my work today is with uh, um, uh, talking directly to people. I have a project called Sustainable You, mm -hmm. in which I teach individuals how to be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what, what do you mean by more sustainable? So uh, footprint is like the number one kind of thing you okay. can think about to be sustainable. What is your footprint? What does footprint mean? Mm -hmm. Footprint is a science-based uh, metric for uh, measuring what your energy, your food, your water, your carbon, so you seek to reduce your footprint on the earth. That old adage about leave, take only photos and leave only footprints. Right. Uh, you, wa you wanna leave as small a footprint on the earth as possible uh, in terms of your uh, resource use. Right. In terms of your uh, influence or your ability to help others, you wanna leave a large footprint. Right. So we talk about these, when I'm coaching, we talk about these various ways of looking at sustainability mm -hmm. and how you can um, be conscious about what you're seeking to do on this planet. Sure, if you really need to live in your 4,000 foot three car garage house, you know. Uh, and so one of the things I do is, again, speak to business leaders. Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually actively seek out uh, business leaders. And uh, another thing I do is I speak to entrepreneurs. So I'm mentor over at Chaminade's Hogan Entrepreneur Excellent. Program. Good. And then I reach out to uh, business leaders through my uh, own uh, self-funding and my own initiative to talk to them about how they can make their companies more sustainable. Mm -hmm. So because business, and I believe uh, business is the largest influence on the planet. And if you look at the sure. aggregate set of behaviors that sure. could be called business. Right. We, so why not start with business? Right, yeah. Another big network, because uh, I'm a systems guy, systems engineering, mm -hmm. uh, another big network is faith groups. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time talking to faith books, faith groups in their language oh. about stewardship, oh. about how they can green their churches, okay. about what it means to be a good steward of these islands oh, okay. and of land in general. But, uh, and it all really comes down to an inside job. Mm -hmm. Who are you? What do you prefer? Oh. And how are you going to get there? Yeah, I mean, it is interesting for, I think it's very true for those of us here on the Hawaii. We have a lot of choices to make. We can do yeah. a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I was just reading a very depressing article that, that basically was looking at the multiplicative nature of wave action on top of rising sea levels mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and its impact on Pacific Atoll Islands. Yeah. And basically pointing out that the wave action aspect has not been incorporated in earlier models. Right. And what this suggests is that rather than being habitable until around 2100, a lot of these places will become uninhabitable around 2050. Uh, very, very sad and very, very troubling for these people. What do you do if you're a family living there now and bringing up your kids there, you know? And it's here too. I mean, yeah. it's not just out in the Marshall Islands or out in the Pacific. It's here on the North Shore. Um, one thing that is being questioned a lot is the use of hardening of the shoreline. Right. And how, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not for hardening the shoreline, but I'm not, I'm not a great proponent of just saying let nature take its course and just let's retreat from the shoreline. There are things we can do to work with the coastline, with the wave, wind, and water action to, um, to protect our people and right. to protect our lands. Absolutely, absolutely. And they're, they're actually investigating a lot of those in the Marshall Islands, uh, although they are still building seawalls. Yeah. Uh, but <clears throat> they've got you know huge, huge issues. They've got nowhere to retreat to, basically, yeah, that's uh, right. except probably here, you yeah, know, while right. I'm here in the mainland. Uh, yeah. they can, and where are people going to retreat? What right. happens to the nature in the uh, conservation zone when the beach starts receding right. inward at a great rate? Those people are going to either leave the islands or go upwards, right. and that's going to leave less room for the yeah. species that are already there. Right. No, there, there is a huge... So conservation is going to be affected right. by... Yeah. And you're right. I mean, businesses drive a lot of this, and so yes. somehow the, the issue has got to be to help businesses see it in their 
long-term, sustainable, stable interest to live as sustainably and operate as sustainably as possible, right, and leave a smaller footprint. And, and that is playing out directly again this year. Here we're heading towards 10 million visitors per year. Mm -hmm. Are we going to have to cap the number of beds we have in Hawaii mm -hmm. for tourists? At what level can, can we be sustainable? Yeah. Yeah. Is infinite growth on a finite planet a still a viable uh, metric for success? Right. It's not. Yeah, I, I live in Waikiki and just a block, less than a block from where they, they, they just built two large oh. condos. And oh. you just look at this and say, did anyone think about the impacts? I mean, there's this huge amount of water use huge yeah. amount of power use, yeah. there's getting more cars on the street, yeah. you know, there's more wear and tear on the roads, there's more just people around walking, you know, using the beach. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oftentimes, I think the sort of long-term and, and more subtle impacts are not fully considered. Well, because we're law, we're, uh, rules and regulations are for today, they're not for tomorrow. And right. so this is what Chip Fletcher and those folks at the Office of Climate Change Sustainability and resilience are doing is they're trying to look out into the future, look over the horizon, right. and seeing what we need to do now to prepare for then. Right. And that that's not what rules and regulations have done to date. Right. Right. And so they didn't have to uh, comply with anything right. any, to any consideration of those ideas. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's very very. Uh... But that being said, we still have plenty of things we can do that other islands and other lands are doing, right. raising the roadways. Uh, you know, we're gonna have to get that gravel and all from somewhere, but we're gonna have right. to raise our surfaces in order to right. uh, adjust and adapt. Right, and again, we should all be doing much more with conserving water and being sure the water, fresh water gets in and recharges our aquifers rather than just pours out as the recent storms. So vividly different, it just pours off the island and ruins the bays. Well, that's another thing I do is I help people design rainwater, rainwater catchment systems mm -hmm. for their homes. And so, uh, but then we have a big water problem because mm -hmm. freshwater floats and as the seawater comes in and uh, inundates right. the porous rock underneath right. of us, it's gonna push the fresh water up and out. Right. And so, what? and then what? Where do our aquifers go? So these are big problems that I don't think we may just be starting to address. Yeah. And, um, and, the, and the challenge is what are, how, do, how much do we care? Mm -hmm. Do we really care? I think we do. But then how are we gonna implement solutions to these uh, actions and um, problems that we have? Right, and how can we best prepare the youth of today to really deal with what they're gonna end up facing because we've sort of, we're a little late to the plate here basically, right? Well, I think we have a good cohort of youth behind us. We don't have enough. We need thousands and thousands more uh, teachers and uh, of, of sustainability in the state and agents of change. But there are hundreds of, I'm embedded in the, in the nonprofit community and there are many, many people working on uh, teaching youth, so I'm highly encouraged. You know, that's why I don't talk about problems anymore, because problems get me into a state of depression. Mm -hmm. Solutions get me into a state right. of optimism. Right. So I stay focused on we, the solutions. We refer to it as <laughs> asset-based thinking. You don't, you, don't, you don't think about the deficits, you think about the assets. Oh, well, you know? good. Yeah, uh, Another way of looking at yeah, it. Yeah, all right. We, 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 in our work with the Pacific Islands, a lot of our languages had to change, help us realize these people bring tremendous amounts of strength, resources to, to bear. That's right. To, to develop their communities better. That's right. You know, and we just have to be aware of it and make And it's inside of, it. of them. Right. Yes, it's, it's not exactly. like something it's, it's that. in their cultures. It's not like money or right. homes or anything. Right. It's their strength. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So that, that's one of the, one of the great things. Uh, so if you had five sentences to, to, tell, to tell youth of tomorrow what, what they need to know to, to be sustainable, to live sustainably, what, what would your advice be to the youngsters of today? <laughs> Oh, that's, uh, well, I just say, uh, f uh, figure out who you are. Mm -hmm. who, who, do you care? Uh, are you interested? What's your life trajectory look like? Think of your life as a trajectory, not so much as a series of dots. Think of it as a continuous curve and figure out who you really are. And then from that go, what's my preference? How, what kind of future do I want to live in? What kind of place do I want to live in? How do I want to express myself? 
Right, as you vividly demonstrated, you can, you can make those choices. You can turn corners and go off in very different directions than you thought you were going, right? And then how do we get there? Right. And the, the, I look to nature. You look at murmurations. There are these huge flocks of starlings. Mm -hmm. There are pods of fish. You watch how thousands of fish can make a turn on a dime. Yeah. And that's how, what we as humans need to learn how to do. Yeah. And so, uh, but they're all thinking together. We're not all thinking together. So, so we need to all start thinking together. And I would urge the, the youth of tomorrow to band with people who think like you and work together for social change. Great, excellent. Hey, now before we wrap up, I'm gonna ask a completely off the wall question. Oh, that wasn't the question. Oh, no, no, uh, completely <laughs> off the wall question. If as a superpower, you could either fly or become invisible, which would you choose and why? Fly, as in fly in the atmosphere, right, right. or become uh, invisible. Um, it, in order to do anything, I would probably uh, become invisible. Uh -huh. okay. And uh, why? Uh, the reason is because I'm a kind of a um, a background guy. Uh -huh. I, I'm a farmer by okay. training and experience. And I like to plant seeds, uh -huh. and planting seeds is invisible mostly. Right. Uh, Farmers are invisible. Right. Yeah. So I would have to say that I, as a farmer, planting cool. seeds of sustainability um, for sustainable leadership, that would be my uh, choice, would be Excellent. invisibility. Excellent. Well, that's that's a Because we all become invisible at the end of this life. Right, exactly. So exactly. Why? And, and our, we can live on only through our deeds that we've done, through our impacts on other people, well, through how we've made other people think differently, right? The seeds we plant right. exactly. are the only things that um, take us forward. Yes, indeed. In yes, time. indeed. So thank you so much oh, for oh, well, this conversation. Well, well thank you. you know, it's, it's been a really rich talk here with Rob Kinslow, who has moved from the farm to the cutting edge military industrial lab, to the world of, of sustainability, climate change, and, and resiliency, and made that transition look smooth and, and flawless. <laughs> I assure you it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> thank well, you so much, well, Rob. Well. It's been great having you here. I've, I've learned a great deal from you, as I do from all my guests. Thank and you. And I'm sure you've taught our, our viewers much more, much more, too. I appreciate you. So come back and join us again on Likeable Science next week. Uh, until then, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science. We'll see you on Think Tech Hawaii.